My dear students, uh, as I told you the previous week, uh, unlike uh, it was originally planned by the university, uh, this week uh, we again uh, have lectures uh, because uh, there is no uh, training uh, week uh, uh, as it was uh, in the original program. Uh, so it means today uh, we have one more lecture and then uh, there will be two weeks uh, when we shall have no lectures and after it uh, we shall go further. We do not know uh, yet uh, in what form we shall be able to have uh, our classes. Uh, one more technical uh, thing I would like to tell you is that uh, I would be grateful if you would uh, send me uh, just a short message uh, if you got uh, uh, what I sent you, if you could uh, understand it, uh, you can hear it well, etc. etc. so that I know if we can go on uh, with uh, this uh, sort uh, of uh, making uh, our common work. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Fatma Triki for uh, for sending me a message. I think uh, she was the only one uh, who did it. So now, uh, as you can remember, uh, at the last class uh, we were speaking uh, about Jesus Christ, who is uh, in the very center of uh, Christian faith, of Christian religion uh, in all respects. And uh, I told you that we are going uh, to speak about uh, uh, Jesus uh, uh, in three different uh, lectures, of which uh, one was uh, about uh, uh, Jesus' life and deeds, his miracles, especially his uh, healings. This was uh, what we did uh, at uh, the last uh, class. And uh, at this lecture, I am going to speak, first of all, about uh, the teaching of uh, Jesus. And uh, then there will be a third one, uh, in fact, the most important one, which will be about uh, uh, the suffering, the passion uh, of Jesus, uh, his uh, death on the, Christ, uh, on the cross uh, and uh, his resurrection. Now, uh, today I'm going uh, first uh, to tell you some general uh, ideas uh, about uh, our uh, today's topic. It is uh, the teaching uh, of Jesus and then after it, uh, as normally, uh, we shall look into some of uh, the texts uh, which uh, you will find also uh, in our syllabus and uh, which uh, uh, you are supposed uh, to read, to understand uh, and uh, to be able to speak about it uh, at the exams. So then, some general ideas. One is uh, we uh, come back uh, to the idea what I told you and which was uh, very, very important that uh, uh, this, uh, this picture that Jesus, is, uh, Jesus Christ is uh, in the middle uh, of uh, the Christian Bible meaning the Old Testament and the New Testament, and of Christian religion both, it means uh, that uh, on the one hand, uh, Jesus looks back to the Old Testament, he gives an interpretation of the Old Testament. On the other hand, the New Testament uh, uh, later, uh, later period uh, texts, uh, and in fact, uh, the whole of Christian theology, Christian thinking, looks back to Jesus Christ and is founded uh, on a certain interpretation of uh, Jesus Christ. And as I told you, you can remember, especially as the one who, as the elected of God, died and was risen uh, by God uh, at Eastern and uh, in this uh, the, 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 in some days. So now uh, we could say with some simplification that uh, what we are going to speak about now uh, it is rather the first part uh, of these two things. Now it is uh, what Jesus uh, taught, uh, how he interpreted uh, the Old Testament. Uh, the prophecies and the, the Torah, the law, uh, for his uh, disciples. Um, 
We could also say, I just was thinking about uh, to give you some more uh, expressions, uh, some, uh, some analogies, uh, some pictures uh, uh, which uh, were and are generally used uh, to speak about uh, the whole uh, what uh, is uh, uh, there in the Christian religion. Uh, and then uh, we could say that uh, Jesus Christ uh, uh, is uh, in the center of uh, the history of salvation, history of salvation, in a sense, uh, we can say that uh, this is uh, what uh, the Bible speaks about, uh, beginning uh, with the creation and until the end uh, of uh, the uh, history of the universe, uh, the last judgment. Uh, this uh, will be, hopefully, the last text uh, uh, about which uh, we shall speak today, uh, a parable of Jesus about the last, uh, just judgment, uh, last judgment. So, we can say history of salvation. We also could say uh, that uh, there is uh, a common history of God and man. This is uh, another way of speaking about everything what you find in the Bible. So the common history of God and man. And uh, it might be astonishing uh, first, but uh, it's interesting that in the Bible uh, we have quite a lot of texts which speak about uh, the relationship uh, between uh, God uh, and uh, his uh, people, the Old Testament and the New Testament people, both. Uh, so it's, uh, it speaks about it uh, uh, like uh, a love relationship, like a love relationship, uh, like uh, uh, the relationship between uh, a man and a woman, a bride and a bridegroom. So these are different uh, ways of speaking about uh, the same thing, what is uh, uh, the essence uh, of uh, the whole of the Bible. And in all respects, uh, we can say uh, that Jesus Christ uh, in uh, the center of, uh, of uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this process, uh, which can be described uh, with the different ways I was speaking about. So, uh, we say that uh, Jesus uh, gives uh, an interpretation of uh, the Old Testament. And this means two things. On the one hand, it means that he is tightly bound uh, to the Old Testament. Uh, it is, uh, in fact, impossible to understand uh, Christian religion and also what Jesus' uh, teaching was uh, without uh, the Old Testament. And uh, this is demonstrated uh, by the fact uh, that in the whole in, of the New Testament and also in the teaching of Jesus, uh, there are uh, uh, lots and lots of uh, concrete quotations uh, from the Old Testament. Very often, uh, it uh, stricto senso uh, is an interpretation, an explanation of one or the other of the laws in the Old Testament. And even if it's not uh, uh, in stricto sensu uh, uh, an interpretation of a text uh, of the Old Testament, uh, the concepts, the ideas, the questions, the problems uh, which are in the heart of the teaching of Jesus uh, come from the Old Testament uh, tradition. But on the other hand, uh, we also can say uh, that uh, uh, it was a, a revolutionary uh, interpretation or reinterpretation of uh, the Old Testament. So you have to see these both sides. On the one hand, uh, how tightly uh, Jesus' uh, his, uh, teaching is rooted in the Old Testament, but on the other hand, we shall see it in, uh, in a half an hour, uh, how he consciously and often says uh, that uh, there is something new coming in what I am going to tell you. One remark to this question is uh, that in fact uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this double uh, truth is uh, not something very new. 
it was characteristic uh, of the prophecy. If you remember, uh, this was what we told about the prophets, uh, that they always went back uh, to the tradition, concretely it meant uh, one or the other uh, of the many uh, blocks uh, of the tradition which were in the Old Testament, uh, and they made uh, a new, fresh interpretation of it. Uh, it meant uh, that they drew a line from the tradition uh, to the actual uh, reality of uh, history of the life uh, of uh, their nation, of the people, uh, in that uh, moment. So, uh, these both sides have to be always seen uh, when speaking about the teaching of Jesus. One more thing uh, which is important is uh, that, uh, as you know, we have uh, different Gospels. So it means uh, we have different uh, collections of the teaching of Jesus. And even if we leave aside a little what we read in the Gospel of John, I will come back for some, uh, uh, with some uh, sentences to this question. But even if we remain only at uh, uh, the three synoptic uh, Gospels, so Matthew, Mark and Luke, we can say that there are some differences uh, among uh, the Gospels uh, as far as uh, the emphasis is concerned uh, with which uh, uh, they draw the attention to one or other uh, part of uh, the teaching of Jesus. So it means that also we can say uh, that there are some parts where one and others where the other aspect of this double truth is uh, emphasized. Sometimes you feel that uh, this is just simply as a, uh, as a teaching of a rabbi uh, and the, the rabbis, uh, that was the most important thing, what they did, it was to interpret, to teach uh, the Old Testament to the people. Uh, and at some other occasions you can have uh, the impression that uh, it's something radically new, something revolutionary, different, uh, from what existed uh, before. Now, one uh, uh, more remark uh, to uh, this question concerning the, the teaching of Jesus. Uh, it, uh, it might have been interesting for you to hear that I always see the, the, say uh, the teaching of Jesus. Why do I not say the teaching uh, of Jesus Christ? Because we can say uh, that, uh, with some simplification, we can say uh, that, uh, you can remember, Jesus Christ is a confession, saying Jesus is the Christ. So that person, Jesus from Nazareth, uh, this, uh, this person who lived here on the earth uh, here and then, and he who did this uh, and who taught these things, uh, this person was the elected Messiah of uh, God. Now we can say that as far as we speak about uh, the person who was teaching about, uh, or at least uh, on the basis of the Old Testament, this person uh, can uh, first of all be called Jesus. Yes, he is Jesus uh, from Nazareth. And when we shall speak about uh, later how the Christians understood, how they interpreted uh, the life and death and resurrection of uh, this person, then uh, we shall rather use always uh, uh, the name Christ. We shall say Christ, or we shall say uh, Jesus Christ, uh, or the Lord, uh, this uh, word also was uh, used. Um, a third uh, point concerning uh, a general introduction uh, uh, to the teaching of Jesus is that it's very interesting uh, there are, that there are uh, some uh, uh, differences uh, in the emphasis, not only as far as the Gospels are concerned, 
but also as far as uh, the different Christian traditions are concerned. So differences uh, uh, in how they look at the teaching of, uh, uh, of Jesus, uh, what the function uh, of uh, the concrete gospel texts is uh, for one or the other Christian tradition. We can say that it is a uh, uh, very very important in fact in a sense the most important thing uh, in uh, the catholic tradition uh, which is very well uh, demonstrated symbolized by the fact that if you go to a catholic mess there you will see uh, that uh, it is only uh, for the reading of the gospel that the congregation has to uh, stand up when they read the Old Testament or when they read from the so-called epistles, uh, which means in fact uh, all the other New Testament uh, uh, books uh, outside uh, the four Gospels, so when they read these all other parts, uh, then they can sit. And when uh, they uh, read uh, the Gospel, then they stand up. Uh, you can imagine that behind there is uh, an idea that this is the point uh, when Jesus himself uh, is uh, among us and speaks to us, so we have to stand up. Now there is an, another uh, tradition uh, which, uh, which uh, can uh, even arrive uh, at the point to say that uh, the teaching of Jesus, Jesus uh, is not at all the most important thing uh, in uh, the Bible because what did we say? We said that the teaching of Jesus uh, is an interpretation of the Old Testament, but uh, the Christian religion is an interpretation of the person, death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, so, uh, one of the uh, greatest uh, 20th century uh, Protestant uh, theologians, uh, a man called Rudolf Bultmann, uh, in his great work, uh, this uh, is one, uh, if not uh, the very best work, uh, which ever has been written uh, on the theology of the New Testament, there he says that the teaching of Jesus uh, is uh, not part uh, of the New Testament theology, it is only a precondition. It's a precondition of everything else. Because Christian theology is uh, the interpretation of Jesus Christ uh, and not uh, the interpretation that Jesus gave uh, to everything else uh, what uh, happened uh, before. And then the last point uh, in our introduction is uh, about sources uh, and uh, different, uh, different uh, styles uh, of the texts uh, what we have. One thing is uh, uh, what uh, I was speaking uh, about already, uh, that uh, usually scholarly research says that there were two sources uh, of uh, the texts uh, of uh, the Gospels. This is also true if we speak uh, especially about uh, those texts in which we read uh, the teachings of Jesus, uh, one from the two sources uh, is the so-called proto-mark, so uh, uh, a lost uh, original form of uh, the Gospel of Mark, in which uh, you could read about uh, the deeds, the miracles of Jesus, uh, and uh, some parts of his teaching too. And there is the other source, which is called Q, from the German word Quelle, which simply means source, which consisted exclusively of uh, teachings of uh, Jesus. So this is one thing. The other thing is uh, that uh, you find uh, a lot of uh, sayings, simple one sentence or two sentence sayings uh, of Jesus, you also uh, find a very important genre, which is the parables, the parables, stories, nice stories, uh, which try uh, to, uh, to demonstrate one very important uh, part, idea of the teaching of uh, Jesus. 
uh, also uh, you have uh, stricto sensu interpretations uh, of uh, the Old Testament law of the Torah if you remember this we shall see in some minutes uh, in fact, these are the forms uh, which we shall read uh, uh, now, texts, uh, which are read texts uh, which are in either of uh, these uh, forms, uh, these styles. And what we shall not speak about is uh, what we have in the Gospel of Joan, which I said is much more complicated, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which would make uh, necessary for us uh, to have uh, some more detailed knowledge about the religious and philosophical ideas uh, of those times. So that's why uh, now we shall not uh, speak about uh, those uh, texts uh, which we have in the Gospel of John. Also, because as I told you, at least according to scholarly research, uh, the picture and the, the, of Jesus and uh, the teachings which we have in this gospel, gospel are further away from the original uh, texts uh, and uh, historical uh, uh, facts uh, uh, concerning uh, Jesus. So the first uh, text uh, what we are going uh, to read is in fact uh, a quite uh, long collection of different texts. It is uh, what is called uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount, on the mountain. This is in fact uh, the longest uh, uh, collection uh, of uh, the teaching uh, of Jesus of which uh, we shall try to read uh, at least uh, the good half uh, of uh, the texts. Some preliminary uh, remarks. Uh, one is uh, that uh, we find this uh, in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapters uh, 5 to 7. So three whole chapters uh, are in which uh, we read the Sermon on the Mount. It is uh, from the Gospel of Matthew, who was uh, from uh, uh, all uh, the one uh, who was the most tightly bound uh, to the Old Testament, uh, to the Jews. So that is uh, why uh, we have uh, the greatest number of uh, allusions uh, to the Old Testament, also concrete uh, quotations from the texts of the Old Testament. Uh, this we have uh, in the Gospel of uh, Matthew. However, it's important to see uh, also that uh, the novelty of Jesus, uh, uh, the very radical reinterpretation uh, of uh, the Old Testament, uh, is absolutely clear also from uh, how we read uh, the teaching of Jesus uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. So it begins by saying, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and told them, saying. And then now uh, we begin uh, with the first uh, of uh, these uh, teachings. Uh, the, uh, there are different parts, uh, clearly uh, separatable uh, parts uh, of what we have in these three chapters uh, of the Gospel of John. Of these, uh, the first one uh, is uh, called the Beatitudes, Beatitudes which uh, uh, means uh, sayings uh, which speak about uh, how a blessed life uh, is possible. In some modern uh, translations uh, you even uh, might read happy. So what is the foundation, the possibility, the basis uh, of being uh, happy? Uh, you might remember that I told you uh, two or three lectures uh, uh, back that uh, this was an existing genre uh, in the Old Testament and I think we read uh, one such uh, uh, part which was the Psalm 1, the very first psalm in the book of Psalms from the 150 psalms uh, was a, a, a beatitude. 
which began by saying uh, that blister is uh, the man who etc etc so that's uh, what we have here then let us uh, read it blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. These are the Beatitudes. And I think uh, perhaps the first thing uh, uh, which comes to your mind when you hear uh, this text is uh, it is the structure of uh, these uh, Beatitudes. Uh, you always have uh, two, two parts. One uh, is a description of a person, a characterization uh, of uh, a person. And then uh, in the second half of that single beatitude, you uh, read about uh, the, uh, the blessed uh, state uh, of that person, of the, the basis uh, of uh, the happiness uh, of that uh, person. And I think uh, for the first sight, uh, you could say that, uh, yes, then uh, it's, uh, it's a structure which tells you that uh, if you behave like this and this and this, then you shall uh, be happy or blessed uh, in this respect uh, in the future. But is it true? Is it really about uh, something which happens now, which you have to do now, and then later there will come some reward. Later you will get uh, the compensation of uh, what uh, happened uh, before what you did. If you make, uh, 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 make uh, uh, a more detailed uh, uh, reading of the text, then we shall see that uh, it's uh, much more complicated uh, than uh, that. Why? One thing is uh, that uh, at some Beatitudes you might have uh, uh, the feeling that uh, the characterization of the blessed people in the first uh, half of uh, the Beatitudes uh, speaks uh, about some suffering, uh, some bad thing, uh, being persecuted, uh, uh, blessed are those who mourn, uh, blessed are uh, those uh, uh, who uh, who are uh, uh, are uh, poor uh, in spirit. There are some other uh, translations also. But on the other hand, you can also read about uh, blessed are the merciful. It's not a suffering to be merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. It's not about a suffering. So anyway, you cannot say that uh, in the first part uh, of these Beatitudes uh, there is something bad, something suffering, uh, something which you would need to endure in order to have uh, the recompensation in the future. And then on the other hand, is it true that what we read in the second part uh, of the single Beatitudes uh, it is only about uh, the future. No, we can uh, we can uh, read uh, things uh, uh, light, uh, like uh, they shall be comforted. 
Will you be comforted only at the end uh, or after the, uh, the, the last judgment? Uh, can you not be comforted uh, now in the present? Uh, what does Jesus say? You will be not comforted now, not the next year, not for any, uh, the other ten years, but after. No, clearly he doesn't want to say that. Also, uh, there are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You cannot think that uh, in no respect uh, can be satisfied your hunger and thirst for righteousness in this uh, world. Also, we could say, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Are the disciples now not the sons of God? No. You cannot say that it's about... Uh, present and future, present suffering and future award. That's not the structure of the Beatitudes. But how could it be this difference between present and future is far away uh, not uh, clear, not uh, even in grammatical sense. And here it might be important uh, to remember that the original uh, text, uh, what Jesus said, it was not in Greek language, it was in Aramean language, and in Aramean, just like in the Hebrew language, and uh, partly it is so with the Arab language, you might remember I asked you, uh, those who come from Arab countries, uh, this difference, which is so very important uh, for at least the modern Western thinking, this, uh, this border between present uh, and future, it didn't exist. It is a very different way of thinking about the world, where the really fundamental uh, difference is only, we could say, perfect and imperfect. Those things uh, which were but are not a reality anymore, and those things uh, uh, which exist, uh, exist or which are in train to come uh, to exist uh, uh, in the future. We could say that behind the whole of this thing uh, you have a thinking uh, which is also demonstrated uh, in the grammar, uh, in the way of how these languages think that uh, it is uh, not a real great fundamental difference uh, between what is now and uh, what uh, will uh, come. So, uh, with now uh, simplifying a little the whole thing, uh, we could say that what Jesus speaks about uh, generally the state uh, of uh, life of the disciples of Jesus or the, the followers uh, of Jesus. He gives uh, a description uh, of this state of life in which, yes, uh, it is included that sometimes they have to suffer, especially in that historical situation, uh, they had to be prepared for a lot of suffering. It belongs to it, it's an aspect of their life. However, that uh, uh, that bliss, uh, that uh, special English word uh, bliss uh, uh, for for happiness uh, in the uh, in the uh, deepest uh, uh, sense of the world, uh, to be blessed by God, that which is uh, uh, the great promise for the for Jesus' uh, disciples. It is something which uh, which exists uh, uh, already in some respects. It is far away uh, from absolute total reality, but it is uh, already in the world, it is already in the life uh, which is approaching to realize more and more fully uh, that sort of blessed state, that sort of happiness, that sort uh, of, uh, of uh, bliss, uh, uh, which uh, is given uh, to those who are the followers of uh, Jesus. 
So this was about uh, the Beatitudes and then we have uh, another short text, in fact two, uh, two, two, two different uh, things uh, we write about in uh, verses 13 to 16, uh, still we are in uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. We read, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So, uh, we said uh, that it is an important uh, aspect uh, of the life of the disciples uh, that they have to suffer, that they are in a minority. There are a lot of other texts which speak about uh, uh, the, the, uh, the disciples uh, of Jesus uh, being in minority. However, here, the next step, it will be absolutely clear that it doesn't mean uh, that uh, the disciples of Jesus could hide themselves from the world and think only about their own life. That could perhaps be a possible misunderstanding of the teaching of Jesus if he didn't have here uh, this part. The uh, followers of Jesus, the disciples, could think uh, that uh, uh, if uh, we are delivered uh, uh, to uh, the hate uh, of the people around us, if they might persecute us, then it would be much better to hide us. And in fact, this was exactly what quite a lot of Jewish people did in the age of Jesus, who went out to the desert and who tried to hide themselves from the great majority of people who made a bad life. And they said that here and now we shall uh, live a really righteous, good uh, way of life uh, which pleases uh, God. And they could hide themselves uh, so very well that uh, you might remember I told you that it was only in 1948 uh, that uh, in a very, rem very remote place, uh, in the caves, uh, their text, their rolls, uh, which text of the Bible and the other texts uh, were found uh, uh, absolutely by accident. No, this is what Jesus does not say. He says uh, that this minority uh, is like a salt uh, in a food. It might be little, but that gives, in fact, the taste uh, to the whole of uh, the dish. And similarly, we have here a big room and uh, you need only a little uh, thing, a lamp, uh, to make light in the whole of uh, uh, that house. Uh, of uh, uh, that uh, room. So it means that uh, the life uh, of the disciples of Jesus can never be a selfish li uh, life, even if not in the sense uh, of uh, an egoistic faith, which speaks about uh, what is uh, in my soul, uh, what is uh, uh, my deepest faith, my love to God, etc. etc. No, it is always. Uh, for the other people uh, too. They have to witness uh, to God's message and love uh, for the whole of uh, the mankind. Just one remark uh, uh, to this, uh, uh, this uh, 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 whole question is that uh, this is the reason uh, why there have been very, very great debates uh, in the Christian church history after the Christian religion became a dominant religion 
in one or another society, of which the most important is uh, that at the end of the 4th century, the Christian religion will become uh, uh, the, uh, the religion of the Roman Empire. There were some countries uh, where even earlier the Christian uh, religion was uh, accepted uh, by that society. The first uh, so-called Christian country was uh, Armenia, you might know. Uh, but uh, is it a normal state uh, for the Christian religion to be in majority? How can the Christian religion, which is uh, the dominant uh, or sometimes the exclusive religion of a society, have the role of the salt uh, or of the lamp? If there is no majority for whom, for whom they would need to make witness about uh, the message and love uh, of uh, God. I do not want to answer this question now, just it's good to know that uh, there is uh, uh, this problem which comes uh, from uh, what uh, we were speaking, speaking about now. And then now we come another very, very important part of the teaching of Jesus. Uh, here uh, we read, <laughs> yes, here we read in this uh, uh, Bible tra uh, translation that Christ came to fulfill the law. But you must know that these uh, subtitles, uh, they are not in the text of the Bible. They were given only by the editors. And I think uh, when he uh, gave this subtitle, Christ came to fulfill the law, uh, uh, he didn't realize what I was speaking uh, about a little earlier. Uh, otherwise, uh, he should have rather written, Jesus came to fulfill uh, the law. Anyway, this is a rather long, uh, long uh, part uh, of uh, the teaching of Jesus, of the Sermon on the Mount. I shall not uh, read everything uh, of it, but uh, first uh, we shall begin with verses 17 to 20, which will uh, uh, make clear uh, the fundamental, uh, or at least many of the fundamental ideas. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Is it clear? What I was speaking about, both sides are very, very accurately uh, said here. That there is uh, the law, and the law cannot be abolished, it should not be forgotten. I came uh, to uh, fulfill or to complete, in some other uh, translations we find this word, uh, the law. But then later we shall uh, read this. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, uh, this uh, is a small letter, uh, uh, which uh, which exists uh, ex existed uh, in the Hebrew uh, Hebrew uh, script, uh, the smallest uh, um, smallest uh, uh, letter. Not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, etc., etc. And then even we, write, we read, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Who were the scribes and the Pharisees? We could say that they were the elite, the religious elite of those days Jewish people. The scribes uh, were the persons who were, uh, we could say, uh, the intelligentsia of that uh, world. They were who interpreted the law, who knew all, uh, all the texts and who were able uh, to, explain, uh, uh, to uh, explain them. And the Pharisees were, we could say, the super-religious persons uh, who made everything uh, to observe the law as strictly as uh, possible. 
what an uh, what a scandalous idea to say that the disciples of Jesus who for the most part uh, were quite simple people in all respects uh, that they should exceed the elite of the society in fulfilling the law how could they exceed those who had the most knowledge about uh, the law the scribes uh, and who really offered their whole life uh, to observe the law every little point uh, or dot in the law now we shall uh, get an answer to it uh, from the next uh, uh, text jesus says you have heard that it was said to those of old to those of old in the old testament you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. You shall not murder, it is uh, one of uh, the commandments of the Ten Commandments. So the, uh, the ethical uh, basis uh, uh, of, uh, not only ethical, no, sorry. It is in all respects the basis uh, of uh, the rules of the life uh, of the Old Testament people. So you have heard, you shall not murder. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, a very religious act, and there remember that your brother has something against you leave your gift there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift so what do we have here we have here uh, a commandment from the old testament don't murder we understand it uh, and uh, can it be a question that it is really absolutely important for all community, for a country, to observe uh, commandments like this? Uh, do not murder, do not steal, uh, do not commit adultery, etc., etc. But then what Jesus says, uh, it is something uh, so absolutely radical. He says that uh, if you have the slightest uh, source uh, in your psyche, in your soul, which uh, leads the uh, other way uh, to murder, then you committed uh, the murder. But it's a nonsense, isn't it? How can it be he so very much uh, radical? Uh, what we have here is in fact, on the one hand, a radicalization of the commandment, and on the other hand, an internalization uh, of the law. The murder, stricto sensu, means something, an act that I kill uh, with uh, my uh, sword or with shooting, uh, I kill the other person. What Jesus says about this uh, that the whole thing has its essence uh, uh, in your soul. The question is uh, what sort of, uh, of ideas uh, uh, you have in your soul and then uh, we could uh, also say that uh, it is simply impossible for anybody anybody psychologically to fulfill the law according to the interpretation of what jesus gave to it how is it possible how can you bear the, uh, uh, the, uh, the heavy burden of this sort of radicalization of the law, how we read it uh, in the teaching of Jesus. And then now we shall read one more uh, from uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this part of uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, from verses uh, 38 uh, to 42. You have heard that it was said, 
an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So if somebody's uh, eye is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, pushed out by somebody, then the same should happen to the person who was guilty. And tooth for tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, your robe, let him have your cloak as well, your other clothes. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, we could say that this is one of the texts uh, which makes uh, clear uh, uh, the, uh, that uh, sort of absolute love which is uh, in the center of uh, the teaching uh, of Jesus. And this is partly an explanation, uh, an answer to the question we were talking about. Our question was that uh, how is possible uh, to have this uh, horrible burden uh, on our shoulder to fulfill the law not only in our acts uh, but also psychologically? Now the answer partly is uh, that it is not about a no, what Jesus speaks about, but it's a yes. It's not about saying what you should not do, but what you should do. And if you are, you set on the road of doing these positive things, of which the essence in one word is love, then the consequence of it will be that you will not do these things. You will even not long for doing these things. Because what, were, what was Jesus speaking about? It was saying that uh, you not only should not kill the other person, but you should not long for it. And who does not know that sort of, uh, of inner state when uh, you always, uh, uh, always lose your mind so much you will say that this horrible person, he should be killed. And perhaps you say that, no, I, I, won't, uh, I won't do it, uh, I want to resist uh, to what is in me. However, we know how it happens in our soul. No, uh, the way of uh, having victory over all those bad things which are in us, all of us, is to turn uh, to the good thing, to the only good thing, which is uh, uh, love. And then uh, one more remark uh, concerning this question is uh, that uh, love, in the interpretation of Jesus, and we also could say that in fact in the biblical sense generally, is much less something emotional than something uh, to do with volition, your intentions what you want to do because uh, just guess uh, it would be somehow really uh, uh, um, impossible to say that you should have the same feeling uh, toward uh, an enemy who made the worst thing in the world to you than to somebody who is very near to you it's that would be a nonsense you cannot have a uh, so positive that sort of feelings what emotions what you have toward uh, your uh, wife or your children or your best friend you can not have the same feelings but you can uh, have the intention of not wanting to make harm even uh, against your enemy but in the same way to try to help him to do good for him this is important in order to understand uh, the sense of love in uh, the Bible generally and especially in uh, the teaching of uh, Jesus. And now we go further to chapter 6 in the Gospel of Matthew. 
Here in the first 20 verses, uh, we have uh, the cornerstones uh, of uh, Christian faith, or we could say the cornerstones, uh, the most important pillars uh, of how the followers uh, of Jesus uh, should uh, uh, live. In fact, these three cornerstones uh, are charity, so acting love, prayer and uh, fasting. These three are the most important things uh, which make up uh, a Christian life uh, according uh, uh, to what uh, we are going uh, to uh, read. Not all of them, uh, because uh, perhaps we do not need uh, in the sense uh, that uh, the teaching of uh, about these three things uh, has a very similar uh, structure and uh, quite uh, a part of it uh, is uh, uh, of, uh, of the message uh, is similar in the three, uh, three uh, different uh, cases. So, uh, we have here beware of practicing your righteousness before other people, so don't practice your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites uh, do in the synagogues, the hi hypocrites uh, uh, who just pretend uh, to be a good person and they are not in reality. So do not do like the hypocrites do it in the synagogues, uh, the Jewish churches, and in the streets, uh, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So it means that the essence of even charity which is in the relationship of one person to the other person, its reality is first of all uh, between God and man. It is not to have in any sense uh, uh, some, uh, some good fame uh, or some reaction uh, from uh, other persons, uh, some compensation. It is all about uh, your relationship uh, with uh, God. Now, uh, we go further uh, to the part concerning the prayer, because here we shall read uh, the Lord's Prayer, which uh, is uh, for sure one of the most important texts uh, in Christianity. So, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, uh, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 
but this is uh, not part uh, yet of uh, uh, the prayer but that's what Jesus uh, uh, tells uh, them going further if you do not forgive others their trespasses neither will your father forgive uh, your trespasses now what's uh, uh, very important here just one single idea from the many which would be needed to speak about but we cannot uh, because of the shortage of time is uh, that uh, it begins uh, with uh, speaking about God it's speaking about uh, that uh, your kingdom come your will be done on earth among us human beings as it is uh, in heaven so it is not uh, uh, saying that uh, i need uh, help in this situation i need more strengths uh, i need uh, some uh, some good ideas uh, to go further on the road of uh, of the way of the life or that I would need, uh, I do not know what sort of consolation uh, in my sorrowness, uh, and then I turn to God. No, it begins by turning to God uh, and, uh, and speaking about uh, the Lord. And in this sense, it is uh, very similar to what we saw in case of the Ten Commandments. You remember it was uh, that in the first on the first table of the Ten Commandments uh, there is nothing about the relationship between people or among them it is uh, about uh, man and God and it is a consequence uh, that uh, if uh, your uh, relationship with God is this and this uh, then uh, your relationship uh, to the other people will also uh, change and then uh, just yeah yes so one one more thing uh, which might be interesting is uh, we have seven seven different uh, requests uh, in uh, the prayer and on from the seven uh, the force is give us this day our daily bread and this is important uh, to show you uh, the the fantastic harmony and uh, the, the the structure of how jesus speaks about human life uh, that the bread belongs to it it is not the very very most important thing but it is there because you have a body you need bread uh, stricto sensu and also in uh, some broader sense so your body is also there in this whole story uh, common story of god and human being but that should never be the most important thing and that should never be uh, becoming to majority in your thinking in your longing etc etc and then uh, uh, something more about this uh, uh, question is uh, what we read in verses 25 to 34 so verses 25 to 32 we are still in uh, chapter 6 therefore i tell you do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing look at the birds of the air they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not of more value than they and which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life and why are you anxious about clothing consider the lilies of the field how they grow they neither toil nor spin yet i tell you even solomon the king solomon the richest king in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these but if god so clothes the grass of the field which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven will he not much more clothe you o you of little faith 
Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So, uh, one thing uh, to gather from this uh, part of the text is uh, how, what, what a, uh, an eye, what a thing that Jesus has for the nature. As he speaks about uh, the birds uh, and the lilies uh, on the fields. So you can see that in this sense, Jesus is not a, a normal, an officially normal religious person who hides himself and uh, uh, is always dealing uh, with what is uh, in his ha head. No, he looks at the world and he sees uh, uh, the power and the love of God in uh, what you can see in uh, the nature. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, then uh, let's come to chapter number seven, that is the last uh, in the Sermon uh, on the Mount. And uh, we shall uh, read two texts from it. One is in verses 3 to 5. So chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, the speck, uh, a little piece uh, of wood? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye, much, much bigger, uh, planker of... Uh, in some other translations we read, we read this word. So why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. I think this very short text is enough to uh, demonstrate uh, uh, the psychological depth uh, of uh, the teaching uh, of Jesus. Because it is so very, very much characteristic uh, of how we think about ourselves and the other persons. To see uh, the smallest uh, mistake, error, bad thing in the life of the other person and to be able to forget, to hide absolutely the perhaps much greater, uh, much uh, heavier burdens uh, what we have in our life. And so that is uh, again something really important uh, 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 a specter of what uh, Jesus uh, speaks about. And then the last uh, text uh, from these chapters uh, is uh, verses 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or fixed from thistles? So, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but diseased tree bears bad fruit. Often we read it in the, in the way that a good tree bears good fruit and bad tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So, 
This is something very simple, very easy, uh, almost evident, uh, we should say. However, it's not so evident as we should think uh, for the first sight. Because uh, we can say this uh, uh, wants to tell us uh, that uh, being a good man, it is not the condition of uh, the love of God toward us. So, it is not like uh, it was and it is uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in most religions uh, and in the thinking of very many Christian persons too, to think uh, that if I will be good enough in this or that respect, if I feel do this uh, or I will observe this, uh, this, uh, uh, this law, be it perhaps uh, in a uh, very general uh, or very uh, spiritualized sense. But anyway, so to say that uh, if I fulfill this or this condition, then by that I will gain the love of God. It, is, it has nothing to do with what Jesus teaches us. What he says is that uh, God loves you. God is Heavenly Father who loves you and it is not a condition how you live your life to the love of God but it is a consequence of it. If you experience the love of God then it will change your life and if we call uh, that sort uh, of realization of the love of God, uh, faith, which is a very general word for the fundamental uh, uh, characteristic of, uh, of Christian rel religiosity, then you can say that uh, your faith has consequences. Not because it's, it has to have, not because it's compulsory, not because uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is forced on you, but because uh, that belongs to the nature of that thing. If you really realize the, if you experience the love of God, then that will form your life and that will make you another man. All right, and then now let's come uh, to another text from the uh, Gospel of uh, Luke, uh, one of the important and uh, wonderful uh, texts. It is uh, from chapter 10, so Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses uh, from 27 to 37, no, 25 to 37. The parable of the Good Samaritan. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, it is important to know that as the tension uh, ever grows between the then elite, the then political and especially religious elite and Jesus, there are new and new ways of uh, this in a bad sense, elite, to try to get rid of Jesus, uh, somehow to make uh, uh, him lose his credibility. And one of the methods was to try to make a trap for Jesus, to pose him such questions to which uh, he uh, should not be able to give uh, an answer or a good answer. So we have one uh, of these uh, traps here. So he asks, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? So he sends him back to the law. How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify, to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? 
neighbor evidently not in the sense who lives uh, in the next house uh, but uh, the other human being jesus replied a man was going down from jerusalem to jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed leaving him half dead now by chance uh, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him he passed by on the other side so likewise a Levite, uh, uh, a second rank uh, priest, that's a Levite, about, uh, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But the Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. A Samaritan, who were the Samaritans? Uh, I could say you uh, they were the hated brothers of the Jews. Two people, two nations, living uh, next to each other in uh, some at some places even mixed up, who both told that uh, uh, we are uh, the people of Moses. However, the Samaritans, uh, uh, those people who remained after, uh, during uh, the Babylonian captivity there in, there in the Holy Land, and who had, uh, who had uh, gone a very different road, road from that which the Jews went uh, when they came back uh, from the Babylonian captivity. So in many respects they were similar, however there were differences and that's uh, one characteristic thing in human life uh, that very often those people who are near to each other can hate each other much more than those who are very far away, who are very different. So it means that the Samaritan uh, for the then uh, hearers of uh, the teaching of Jesus uh, was the worst kind of people. They were the most hated people. And then Jesus says this parable, a Samaritan who sees uh, this uh, uh, unfortunate person had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on, on oil and wine. Then these were the best medicaments oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And uh, the next day he took out two denarii, money, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the men who fell among the robbers. He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So, to be mercy, merciful, uh, that is uh, what uh, we uh, read uh, in the Beatitudes at the beginning uh, of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, merciful, uh, which is in fact the consequence of, uh, of love. It's an even more broader uh, concept is uh, love, the biblical love, the love understood as Jesus uh, understood uh, it. And then we said that there is the love of uh, the Heavenly Father, which is uh, in the foundation uh, of Christian life. And then there might be consequences uh, uh, of this in the life of the person who realized uh, the love of God, the merciful God, who was able to accept uh, what God uh, wants uh, to uh, give uh, him. And uh, the way as we live uh, among each other, is in fact uh, all a consequence uh, of uh, this sort uh, of uh, relationship uh, between uh, God uh, and uh, human beings. And then speaking about this, uh, uh, there is uh, one more thing uh, which is important uh, to emphasize, 
which is uh, that uh, uh, Jesus calls uh, God uh, Abba. Uh, it, is, uh, it is really a word uh, directly from the mouth of Jesus because that's not in Greek. That's one of the few words which were not translated. They were so very important. They had such a strength, such an importance. They had in themselves so much the essence that the translators felt that they should not translate it, but instead to teach the people, the Greek-speaking people, uh, this word. So Abba. And what Abba uh, means uh, is... Uh, I would say it is daddy, it is daddy, and it is very bad uh, that uh, in later vernacular translations uh, to Hungarian and English and other languages, uh, the word by which uh, this uh, uh, Abba was uh, translated uh, often uh, uh, had the connotation of something very, very powerful of something uh, very prestigious, uh, of uh, the image uh, of the father uh, who, is, uh, who is huge, uh, who is very, very strong. It's quite right, we can say it about God. However, there was lost, uh, especially the thing which was uh, characteristic uh, of how Jesus understood uh, and interpreted the whole of the Old Testament, that uh, God is not only very powerful, who is the Lord over uh, all the world, all the nations, uh, also the whole universe, uh, the creation, the nature, everything, but he is uh, like a daddy, like a loving father uh, who bows uh, down to uh, his uh, child, to his uh, uh, children. And this will be, in fact, uh, the answer to the question, how is it possible that Jesus radicalizes uh, so much uh, the law? We said that uh, it's psychologically impo uh, un uh, impossible to be so perfect, so saint, so good man, that you should uh, not, uh, observe the law in uh, your heart too, not only in your acts. Uh that really would be an unbearable burden if it came from a powerful God who is not a loving father. But it's the other way around. If uh, there is this aspect uh, of the description of relation between God and man, what we have here, that sort of love, that sort of mercy, uh, which uh, uh, is demonstrated in, the, in, in very, very uh, many other texts too, and which is demonstrated by this little word that Jesus says uh, that Abba, that you can say to God the same word which you can, in a very, very intimate relationship, uh, say uh, to God. And then uh, we have another, uh, how many minutes we have? Uh, more? Six. Six? Yep. All right. Uh, perhaps we shall not be able to go to the very end, uh, but uh, the, before the last uh, text uh, we have... Uh, from uh, chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. It is the parable, uh, the parable of the prodigal son, or often uh, we uh, have uh, the, the word of the lost son. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me and he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the young and son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, 
and there he squandered his property in reckless living. So he spent uh, spent all of uh, his uh, money in a in an immoral living and immoral uh, life. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine uh, arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs, pigs which were unacceptable uh, animals for Jews, uh, disgusting, uh, forbidden animals. And he was longing to be fed with the pots that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. We could say that is the maximum which uh, human beings from their own force, strengths, uh, can uh, reach at, arrive at. And he arose and came to his father, but he while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He must have been looking very often out of the door to look at the road, waiting for the song coming there. That's only my interpretation. So, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Is it really in harmony what we have image about God? No, I think it's something really radically new. And the son said to him, but he planned to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened, uh, the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began uh, to celebrate. What an image about uh, God, the Heavenly Father, being in joy, almost like a little uh, child who has got some uh, very nice present, uh, at whom we very often smile and say, oh, how nice it is that this little boy is so much in joy because of that present uh, what he got. And Jesus speaks about uh, in such a... Uh, almost scandalous way about God, whose most important characteristic is his love toward human beings, toward lost beings, toward not the good ones, not the elite, but to everybody. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out to him too and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he, the father, said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, 
for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and uh, is uh, found. Because there is a possibility for everybody, every human being, uh, to be lost and also to be found to uh, lose uh, his way uh, in uh, the desert or in the, uh, uh, in the bush and uh, to find back the way which was made by God, the Heavenly Father, for the person, quite personally, to be able to return to him. That is, in fact, uh, perhaps uh, the most important uh, uh, essence uh, of uh, the teaching uh, of Jesus uh, and uh, with this now we end and uh, we shall go further not in the next two weeks uh, but after it uh, speaking uh, about uh, the death and resurrection of uh, Jesus. Goodbye.